Dr. Hovind, I love your doctoral thesis. I've torn it to pieces with Howes and Garfield. I can't remember when I last pissed myself laughing. It's a good thing the thesis mopped the piss off the floor. Welcome to part 36 of this read through and peer review of Kent Hovind's doctoral dissertation, which was published on WikiLeaks.org on December 9th, 2009. If you have not yet seen the first episodes in this series, then I recommend that you go back and see those first, as in this episode, I will start off exactly where I left off in the last. In the last episode, Ken told us about how Hollywood tends to portray preachers as immoral and doing evil deeds. Personally, I found that somewhat ironic. He continues along that line in this episode. You will never see the truth in the Hollywood movies about Christianity. Well, Kent, there's two things about that. The first being that you rarely see truth in anything done by Hollywood. Secondly, movies about Christianity tend to be somewhat boring, and boring movies don't make any money. That's why they tend to be so low budget. When you get out of prison for tax fraud, why not look up Kirk Cameron and ask him about Christian movies? But anyway, there is a deliberate war being waged against religion in general, and Christianity in particular. Oh yes, Kent, that massive, massive majority is being so victimized by a tiny minority. It's a bit like apartheid, really, isn't it? You're just so oppressed. But we'll continue. Other religions, such as Hinduism and Buddhism, are taught as being okay, even in the public schools. But the idea of bringing in Christianity is utterly despised. Well, Kent, I think what you'll find is most of the students in public school tend to be of a Christian background anyway, and that Hinduism and Buddhism are okay, and that's Adherence to these religions should not be victimized, should not be persecuted. They should be tolerated. Furthermore, I think you'll find that the approach they give to Hinduism and Buddhism is more in line of making students aware of them. When it comes to Christianity, however, people like yourself will stop at nothing until Christianity is completely taken over and we find ourselves back in the 18th century. But we'll go on. The Humanist Manifesto 2 goes on to say, Any account of nature should pass the test of scientific evidence. In our judgment, the dogmas and myths of traditional religion do not do so. Ah, yes, Kent. Let me just pause for a moment and put my soft gloves back on. I wouldn't want to hurt myself from the face palming that is sure to result from your next statements. Kent goes on. If they really mean that, the account of nature should pass the test of scientific evidence, they should examine and see if evolution will pass the test of scientific evidence. Hmm. Let me think for a moment. Ah, yes, it does. It so overwhelmingly does. Go on, Kent. In order for something to be scientific, it has to be observable. Really, Kent? Are you sure? I thought it had to be testable, verifiable, and most importantly, falsifiable. But do go on. Anything outside the realm of observation is not scientific. Well, Kent, the first thing that comes to mind is, go find me a talking snake. The second thing that comes to mind is that with that sweeping statement, you are dismissing such scientific theories as the theory of gravity, electromagnetism, 
and quantum physics, areas of study which are either purely mathematic in nature or where the subject of the study cannot be observed directly. However, its nature can be determined by its effects on the environment around it. But do continue. For something to be scientific, it must be testable. Hmm, yes, Kent. Evolution, by natural selection, is testable, and most importantly, it's falsifiable. Researchers and scientists can make predictions based upon that theory. And, believe it or not, Kent, the results they get back agree with those predictions, and therefore verify the theory. But carry on, Kent. We'll ignore your bad grammar. There is no observation to back up evolution, and no test has devised to demonstrate it. Well, Kent, I assure you, there is. The fact that you haven't read about it, or understood it, or even agree with it, is no concern of mine. If evolution occurred in the past, it should have been preserved for us in the fossil record. Hmm, it did Kent, and it has Kent. It so assuredly has. Carry on Kent in your broken English. We have trillion of fossils, yet we have absolutely no evidence of evolution occurring in the past. Hmm, and would you like to take time to justify that statement? No, you wouldn't. Hmm, because you can't, can you, Kent? But I'll let you finish. There is nothing going on in the present that gives evidence of evolution. Hmm, not even nylonase and swine flu, bird flu? How about antibiotic-resistant bacteria? You know, superbugs, strains of common bacterial diseases that have, over time, become resistant to the antibiotics that we've been throwing at them for all these years. But carry on, Kent. Stephen Jay Gould and Niles Eldridge, two famous evolutionists, said at the higher level of evolutionary transition between basic morphological designs, Gradualism has always been in trouble, though it remains the official position of most Western evolutionists. Smooth intermediates between basic kinds are almost impossible to construct. Even in thought experiments, there is certainly no evidence for them in the fossil record. Curious mosaics, like Archaeopteryx, do not count. And yes, Kent, are you going to put that into context for us? Are you going to explain that these two scientists, who absolutely, undoubtedly um, advocate evolution by natural selection, um, are actually explaining about Archaeopteryx? Are you going to explain that they're talking about punctuated equilibrium, which is a specific aspect of the theory of evolution? The idea behind punctuated equilibrium is that a species will remain relatively unchanged while ever its environment and its environmental conditions also remain unchanged. However, if these conditions should change, if the organism in question finds itself in a different environment, then it will rapidly adapt to fit these new conditions, and you may find yourself with a completely new species. You see, Kent, while many scientists may argue about the nuances and the mechanisms for evolution, you won't find any of them that actually argue against evolution. <laughs>